This video explores the various types of definitions. There are a wide variety of ways that one can define terms. And of course, terms are very important in logic and critical thinking and critical reasoning. It's extremely important to understand the terms that you are using. So we're looking at how various terms can be defined. So of the types of definitions, there are many kinds and various uses. Now, some errors in reasoning often occur because we're not clear on what type of definition is being provided. And so it's important to understand the type of definition that is used when a word is clarified, when a word is defined. So here is one way to define a word is by ostensive definition. An ostensive definition is done by pointing to or showing or displaying the thing that is to be defined. This is also known as nonverbal extensional. That's a knife. This is especially, especially useful for someone whose vocabulary is very limited. So when a toddler first begins to learn words, when an infant first begins to learn words, uh, someone who doesn't know the language maybe, you point to things and then say the word. So you point to a ball and say ball. Uh, or, you know, it could be an adult with a very good vocabulary, but they're in an unfamiliar surrounding and they're supposed to meet someone at the great clock tower, but they don't know where that's at. And you might ask someone and they just say, what is this great clock tower? And they just point to it so you can see it. Now, there are some problems and limitations of ostensive definitions. For one thing, these are prone to error. It's not always really clear what's being pointed at or displayed. And error can also be present when somebody's thinking that a particular aspect is essential for a general term. So for example, if somebody shows a boat and that boat has a sail, then the person may conclude that all boats have sails and if other water vessels don't have a sail, then it's not a boat. So this is easy to get confused. And of course, it is very limited for a couple reasons, at least. First of all, the term to be defined has to be around to point at. You have to have an example nearby in order to display it or point to it. And second, ostensive definitions can't be used at all for abstract objects. If you try to point to the gross national product, you will fail. You can't point at batting averages, et cetera, other abstract concepts. So ostensive definitions are quite limited because of this. Verbal extensional definitions are when somebody defines a word by listing things in a set of what's being defined. You could be able to list all the things being defined. So you might say the planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Pluto, etc. You know, you, you provide the list that's needed. But if you tried to do that with stars, obviously you would fail. If you start, stars are Alpha Centauri, Polaris, the Sun, you know, you cannot continue in, in providing a, a complete list there. So you just give a set of examples. Now, again, confusion might occur. Uh, so if I were to say to somebody, well, dogs are, you know, Lassie, Scooby-Doo, Snoopy, Beethoven. Now, it's not clear if I'm referring to fictional characters only, because all of those are fictional characters. Maybe it's limited to fictional dogs. Maybe I am talking about actual dogs because there certainly have been dogs but named with those same names. So it can be confusing when you're just listing words. Now, intentional definitions are done by listing all and only the properties that a thing must possess for the term to apply to it. 
This is the kind of definition that philosophers are especially interested in, and it's very difficult to do. Now, a couple terms can help explain what's going on. So, definiendum is the term that is to be defined. It would be what you would look up in a dictionary, for example. And the definiens, that's the phrase that does the defining. So, in our case here, the phrase that does the defining is the definiens for the definiendum, definiens. Hope you followed that. If not, uh, rewind it, try it again. Uh, but again, as I said, this is what philosophers often attempt. So when we explore ideas like free will or justice, we are trying to find that definition that applies perfectly, right? That all and only the properties that the things possess has it. Now, a lexical definition is somewhat of an attempt for an intentional definition, but it, you usually don't get all the necessary and sufficient conditions for the thing. So this is a, a, an intentional definition as a dictionary provides. If you are writing a philosophy paper on something like uh, justice or free will, then you should not be looking up the terms in a dictionary, right? That's not going to help. Uh, but Obviously, dictionaries are helpful. You have to have the limitations. Uh, it must not be too broad or too narrow or circular. So a lexical definition needs to avoid all of those problems, even if it can't provide the necessary and sufficient conditions. So for example, being too broad, if we define a bank as an institution that handles financial affairs, well, that's close, I mean, that might seem right, but it's actually too broad because that definition would include brokerage firms, insurance companies, um, other institutions besides banks. And, and so you, you don't wanna do that, right? If it's too broad, the definition is going to include other things that you don't want it to do. On the flip side, too narrow means that the definition would be, it would exclude some things that ought to be included. So, for example, if we define a planet as a massive object that orbits the sun, we exclude planets that might orbit other stars. So we don't want to do that. That would be too narrow to limit it to those that orbit the sun. And then a circular definition would include the definiendum in the definiens, which is going to be problematic, right? So for example, if you wanted to define an altruist as someone who displays altruistic behavior, that's circular and that's not very helpful. Stipulative definitions are when a term is introduced and the meaning of the word is simply stipulate. So this would be when you're introducing a new word into the vocabulary. An example is Tigon, a word introduced a few decades ago. A Tigon is the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion. Now, normally uh, when you do a stipulative definition, the meaning the, or the the sound of the word, the meaning stipulated, it doesn't have any natural connection to the sound of the word. Now, there might be exceptions with onomatopoeia. Uh, I should have written that up on the screen. O-N-O-M-A-T-O-P-O-E-I-A. -O -O -E yes, that's how it's spelled. Onomatopoeia. Those are words like buzz or boom or zip. They sound like the word uh, the sound of the word sounds like what it's referring to, a boom, right? You, you have the, the, the connection there that's natural. Now, technical terms are often stipulative. So, for example, cloud is in cloud storage. You, that's a new term in the language, so you just stipulate what that means, or defrag, or even software, and other technical terms that are first introduced into the vocabulary are provided with these new definitions. So we just stipulate what we mean by these terms. Precising definitions are definitions that make a vague term 
more precise. So we talked about problems with vagueness in the earlier video on language. And this is often done for a specific purpose. So since we have a lot of terms in our language that are vague, we often need to clarify the parameters of those vague terms. So for example, full-time student. If we want to limit certain uh, possibilities for a student and, and limit the uh, rights and responsibilities that a full-time student has or, or limit the uh, financial aid that might be available, so we might need to define it. So, for example, someone enrolled in 12 or more credit hours uh, is often a cutoff on how we define a full-time student. For the sake of a lease, the word pet may be given a precising definition. So maybe it'll say something like a non-human animal whose adult weight is more than one pound. If you have one of those, you have a pet, right? That it might be vague otherwise. Restaurants give precising definitions for children. You know, children can eat free. What do we mean by children? children who are under age 12. Our legal system does this with adult. So an adult for some purposes is age 18, for other purposes age 19, for still other purposes adult may be age 21. It depends right on the circumstances and what precising definition might be allowed. Now it should be noted that precising definitions cannot appeal to normal use because Normal use is vague, right? Adult is a vague word. Children is a vague term. So you can't just appeal to a dictionary definition or normal use when you're doing this. You have to artificially create boundaries for these words. Theoretical definitions are a way of a form of precising definitions. So the intent is to reduce vagueness, but these connect terms that are being defined with other terms in a theory. So for example, if you were defined to define momentum in physics, you can say momentum is mass times velocity. Of course, you have to know the broader theoretical structure. So you have to know what a mass is, you have to know what velocity is. And often the term just can't be understood at all without that knowledge of the broader theory. Now, sometimes this is related to unobservables, things that we can't observe directly with our own senses, like electrons or quarks, and so we give theoretical definitions to those objects or things. In other contexts, someone might provide a persuasive definition. Here, this the intent is to invoke an emotional response. Now, that could be for positive, or negative. So you might define a liberal or a conservative in different ways. It might be positive or negative depending on what emotions you're trying to evoke. Here the definition provided is usually not an acceptable, uh, not acceptable from the perspective of the other person's point of view. So for example, if someone were to define pro-life and they did it like this, so pro-life people, they're anti-choice. What they are all about is against a woman's right to choose. Well, obviously that would not be acceptable to someone who considered themselves pro-life. On the flip side of that, somebody might say pro-choice. Well, a person who's pro-choice is really anti-life. These are the people who want to kill babies, right? Obviously somebody who's pro-choice would not accept that definition. Those are both emotionally charged, intended to evoke a negative response. Syntactic definitions are a bit more challenging. These are given for words that merely serve a syntactic purpose in our language, like conjunctions or prepositions and articles, like a and the, right? It's hard to define these terms. So instead, what we often do is the function of the term is described rather than the meaning itself. So that might be done by giving a synonym or by an implicit definition. And we might have, the, as an example, the word or, 
is a conjunction that introduces an alternative. So then we might use it in a sentence. You can have soup or salad. There's your alternative and the or is highlighted in order to show how it's used. So in a sense, this technically isn't a definition, but it does help someone understand the meaning of the word. So in a broader sense, it is a definition. There are implicit definitions as well. And so here again, very similar to syntactic definitions, you might define the term by showing how they're used rather than trying to provide a meaning. And I used the super salad example uh, previously, but it is an implicit definition in that case because you're not really attempted to provide a lexical definition. You're not stating the meaning in this case, other than by giving an example. So implicit definitions, you are merely giving examples of how the word is used in a sentence or a phrase. Finally, operational definitions. These are when a repeatable and physical operation is given as a standard for determining whether a term may be correctly applied. So it may not be quite clear, so you provide, here's our standard, here's what we're going to do to know for sure if this term applies. So it could be in the context of a scientific uh, setting, uh, for example, in meteorology, you might say the barometric pressure is 30, what does that mean? It means that in a standard mercury barometer, the mercury will be at the level of 30 inches. Now we typically don't use standard mercury barometers anymore, but it, that's a way of providing an operational definition. What do we mean when we say the barometric pressure is 30? That's a, a, what we mean by saying it. This is what would happen if that's the case. Operational definitions are popular in the area of psychology, for example, and many other social sciences and other areas, but they could be controversial. So for example, if you wanted to uh, provide an operational definition of angry, and you talk about blood pressure and facial expressions and so on, uh, you may not be really capturing what it means to be angry. But you could describe it, you could provide a, a way of measuring it by those things. You can measure the blood pressure, you can tell whether the, the mouth is tilt it up or down, or if there's a grimace in place, you could define those things. You could define intellect by how one scores on an exam, right? Somebody has an IQ of 120 means they get this result on this exam. So as a question to think about, what's an operational definition for the cat weighs seven pounds? Okay. If Pa little pause there if you want to think about it, but it'd be something like this. When the cat is placed on the scale, the scale will read seven pounds, right? So it describes this process to determine if, how the definition works. That is the conclusion of definition. So I hope that helps keep those in mind as you're going through and reading philosophy. If somebody's introducing a new term or if somebody's providing a definition, think carefully about what they're trying to do.